welcome again to Henry's Blues House at the Bull's Head in Birmingham. Uh, this is called Blues Talking. It's the uh, sensible, civilised bit of the evening before that rally music starts and gets you all dancing and things like that. Um, this, I believe, is the first time we've actually chatted to a drummer. You know what a drummer is, he's a bloke who sits at the back and goes and gets the beers and things. Yes. Um, and this drummer is a, he's sort of the go-to drummer around here. Everyone wants to, the top class band, first guy to go to is the drummer, and the drummer that always go to is Roy Adams. So let's welcome Roy Adams. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. Now, Roy, yes. um, you and music, where did you first remember hearing music, first to encounter it, first got interested in it, before you even started thinking about playing? Okay, well, pretty much as long as I can remember. Um, um, from when I was about maybe 9, 10, 11, and uh, my sister, who's actually here tonight, had a small dance set record player, and she was constantly playing Beatles, and I'd never heard this sound before, and I got really attracted to the sound of this, this band, um, who were creating their own songs, but also doing some old R&B and blues songs. So that was about the first time, I, I guess it was about 9, 10, um, yeah. So it's the girly music of the Beatles that got you. The girly music of the Beatles, yeah, initially, yeah. <laughs> then you were into the real band like the Rolling Stones, right? Actually, I was never a Rolling Stones fan. Oh, what's your band band boy? So um, initially the Beatles, then I sort of a complete um, turnaround. I got into The Who, uh, one of my first loves as a band, and, and from the, the drumming point of view, which was obviously Keith Moon. Uh, and that sort of turned me on to drumming, I think. Um, and I remember going out and buying all the Who singles. Uh, and then I got into John Mayall. If we talk, you know, obviously the blues connection. Uh, John Mayall was my first sort of uh, key to the blues, I think. Were you considering playing at that time? Yeah, I, I was quite a late starter actually playing drums. Um, I don't think I picked up a pair of sticks when I was 15 or 16. I mean, I'm totally self-taught, which I never advocate, but that's the way I came through. I, I'm, um, and then through Keith Moon, and then hearing these great drummers who played with uh, John Mayall, Ainsley Dunbar, Keith Hartley, Huey Flint, I think was the first guy I heard. And these, the shuffle rhythm, which is the, the cornerstone of any, every great blues band, that shuffle rhythm, I hadn't heard anything like it. You don't hear that rhythm on the radio at the time, you know. So that was my introduction to the um, to the blues. So what was the point at which you decided to persuade your parents to buy you a drum kit? <laughs> I don't think I ever persuaded them. They they obviously saw that I was really enthusiastic about music, and I, the usual thing I had a pair of. I think my dad was a keen gardener, and uh, yeah, these garden canes that I used to break into drumstick lengths and play on a stool or on some pots and pans. And obviously I was doing this, driving them crazy. And they eventually bought me, which was a fantastic first drum kit. It was a Gretsch drum kit, wow. um, which was a, a champagne spark on beautiful orange champagne spark. Uh, and they, they, were, they, were, they were fantastic. They really supported me. So uh, that was about 16. Um, and then all I can remember is just playing, playing, playing hours every day. The neighbors loved it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to uh, driving, driving into touch with other musicians and ultimately come to play with them? Okay, well, again, initially that was through my parents, through my mother, who, because I was I'm quite a shy individual at that age. Quite laughing. And my mum worked with somebody whose partner was a bass player. And the usual thing, oh, you should come in here, my son is really, really good, yawn, yawn, you know. But eventually this guy came along and he heard me play in my mom's front room. And uh, he said, oh, man, actually, this kid's not too bad at all. So that was my first um, introduction to me. It was a guy called Stuart Duncan, who was a fantastic, fantastic bass player, uh, who also knows a lot of the local luminaries, John Caswell. Um, you know, you know what people I played with locally. John was the uh, 
uh, of a really good friend of this guy, Stuart Duncan. And, and then I sort of never looked back. And so the things start snowballing from then on, I think. You know, and so you're similar age, aren't you, to Caswell? Okay. I'm a, a little bit younger. <laughs> so were you aware of him at that time? No, this is, this is really, uh, we're talking about now, the early 70s, I think. Uh, I first met John, uh, let me think, through the, the country and western scene, because John's a, a great, great country player. And I first started working with John um, in the early 80s. Late. Is that your first band? No, my first band. Take, take us through okay. that. The very first band I played with was with this guy I just mentioned, Stuart Duncan. And a guy called John Thomas. Do you remember John Thomas? In a band called Budgie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was. I was, at the time, I was an apprentice tour maker, and I hate, absolutely hated it. I detested it. But they gave me a break because they knew I was in a band, and they offered me a gig at their social group. And that was my very, very first gig. And I remember the first ever song I played to people, and it was Crossroads, uh, the Cream version. And obviously, I went on to discover Robert Johnson and uh, Muddy Waters and all those great people. But that was the first song I ever played in front of people. And Crossroads. It's like pulling teeth, is it? And which band was that? You know, uh, I don't actually know what it was called. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure we had a name at that time. Um, so sorry, Jim, I can't so tell you. you. How long have you got to come to a band and join games? Are you on stage? Oh, it's, 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 it's a long, long, long process. I suppose the first is successful band of any note I played with was a band called Rainmaker. Which was, do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Which was mid 70s, and that was with Brian Baddams, uh, Mark Stanway, Keith Randall, yeah. uh, um, Roger Heath. And we were playing all this crazy, really avant garde, jazz rocky blues stuff, but um, that was about 75, 76. You grew up in a very interesting generation locally, didn't you? Yeah, I think I did. Yeah, I mean, really good players around. And I think the touchstone of that generation is the fact they could play. Yes, yeah, so really, good musicians. Well, do you remember the sort of mid seventies when the railway in Curzon Street? They had a different band every night. Roger Hill was there, Magnum, and what was interesting as compared to now, um, you had a different band every night playing different styles of music, and a lot of it was original, original music, um, and nobody was sounding the same. So, and I think. In those days, people really learned their craft, you know, as a musician. Um, and everybody was chasing each other, everybody was urging each other on to get better and better. So those were the fantastic days, the mid-70s. So who, who were the local stars when you sort of got onto the scene? Who were the, the big names? I think the people I used to look up to were people like Roger Hill, uh, a while later. Steve Gibbons? Steve Gibbons, of course. Bob Wilson, or, or I went on to play with him, Ruby Turner's band for in 20 years. But those were the people, slightly older than me, four or five years older than me, those were our heroes, especially Steve Gibbons, with Bob Lamb on drums and uh, Dave Carroll, Bob Wilson. And those were the guys we looked up to at that time, yeah. It was a great era for, for, for local rock, I and mean, a guitarist like Dave Pritchard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I don't know him so well. He's a study yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Gaz Morris. And, yeah. Yes, Gaz, I know Gaz Morris. And, and of course, I played the, the original Henry's. I want to come on to that. Oh, sorry. But, 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 but <laughs> at that time, there were some really great rock bands around, but none of them were emerging on a national scene. We had um, all the radio bands coming through in the early 80s. Yeah, like, like, yeah. Uh, Seal Pulse and UB40 and um, Russell Youth all at the same time. Duran Duran's came out, what, mid 70s? Yeah, think. yeah, same, same thing. Yeah. Um, but the rock bands that they proliferated got on the gigs. Great style. They didn't actually seem to go anywhere. No, no. But like, but you, like you say, the melting pot of Birmingham in that period was just fantastic. Obviously the heavy metal thing, you know about that, the Sabbath and... Uh, but also the blues thing started coming through as well, didn't it, with, with Henry's and, you know, all that. Yeah. So tell me about your first encounter with Henry's. Um, champion Jack Dupree. <gasps> uh, do you remember? Well, you obviously do, yeah. And I can't remember who else... I, I, I can't remember how I even got hired for that. Cause I was quite still a young green musician at the time. You're probably cheap. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, always cheap, yes. Yeah. In fact, Colin Cooper, the original Climax 
Yeah, yeah. It, but his famous quote about me was Roy Adams, uh, the, the, <laughs> the best drummer in his price range. I still believe So, yeah, so you, the Henry's, and I remember being really scared because this guy was a black American blues artist. And I thought, he's going to eat us alive, this guy. But he turned out to be a sweetheart. And I remember, I think it may have been Brian Badham's on bass. Yeah, yeah. Um, I can't remember who else, but maybe it was on guitar or keyboards, but um, it wouldn't have been keyboards because it was him. But yeah, so that was a that was a great time for me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a very interesting band to come to a band in those days with like status <coughs> quo would play to lords of 120 people. And yeah, is that true? Yeah. 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 yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah. 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 It was great. So, set up good grounding. At what age did you go pro? Or did you sort of drift into it? I guess my first pro gig was early 80s, and again, this was definitely with John Caswell. It was a country band, uh, and it was Patsy Power and the Good Timers. Oh, well. Wow. Remember that? Yeah. 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 And, but I went from virtually nothing from being with this jazz rock band where we all loved and we all thought we were marvellous and everything, but nobody was earning a penny. So John came up to me, we, we got to know each other a little bit, and he said, Look, this is a wage, this is £100 per week, whether we gig or not. Of course, you always give it seven nights every week, you know. Uh, and I did that for a couple of years, early 80s. Uh, but I decided after two years, I can't do this for the rest of my life, it's driving me crazy. God bless you, Patsy. But um, <laughs> I had to get out of that and move on to Pastures New. And the Pastures New was no more money again. So. Yeah. <laughs> the Pastures New, what? Well, a band called Resistor, which was Pete Oliver. Uh, yeah, Walt Tolster. Tolster. Um, but then I did that for a couple of years, and I suppose my big break came in 1985. We'd been recording this Resistor album about Bob Wilson's studio, and Ruby Turner was about to sort of emerge onto the scene quite big. She had a new album out, she had a, um, a record deal with Jive Records with Billy Ocean, and her drummer at the time was Bob Lamb, from previously from Steve, Steve Gibbs. Bob Wilson had heard me play doing this album and, and Bob became really ill because he had Crohn's disease, he had to have surgery and so the drum seat became available and I got recommended and I, would, would you like to maybe try for the Ruby Turner? Yes please. So I remember going for the audition at Rich Bit Studios, met Miss Turner for the first time who actually didn't even acknowledge my presence at the, the audition but that's Ruby. And, uh, but, I got, I got, I got the gig, and from the, from getting the gig, the next thing was six weeks on tour with Ruby and Billy Ocean. Uh, Fantastic. That was about eighty five, I think. Yeah. So that was your exclusive job for a long while. For nearly twenty years, I did wow. Ruby. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, great, great singer, fabulous singer. Yeah. So, what happened? Did her dates dry up, or did you? Decide well, no. What What really happened was pretty much the same time as I started playing with Ruby, I met Colin Cooper at a, just a jam scenario at the Sully Park Tavern, we probably all know where that is, uh, and I just got up, I was asked up to play two songs with Colin Cooper, and he came up to me after and he says, what are you doing? I said, well, I've just actually joined the Ruby Turner band, but he said, I really, really like the way you play drums, we need a drummer, are you able to do it? I said, well, probably not actually, but... So, as it turned out, I was able to juggle it for, for the next nearly 17 years, juggle both bands. <laughs> and they were both totally different musically. I mean, the client, you know about Clarence Blues Band, great, fantastic uh, blue, one of the great British blues bands. Um, so, like, back to your initial question, it eventually, you know, caught up with me after 17 years, and I couldn't carry on doing both gigs. So, so you quit really? I did, yeah. Yeah. Did you still ignore him? No, no, we, we're friends. I actually saw, I saw her um, last year on the plane to Bar Barcelona and seen her for about five years. But we're still in touch on Facebook and it's just, we were good friends. And we, we spent a lot of time on the road together, you know. And I made some really good friends, Bob Wilson, who I mentioned. Paul Turner was on bass guitar, who plays with Jamiro Kwai now. Um, yeah, so uh, it was a great, great, great band. So when you joined Climax, who were, who's, who's the originals? I knew Climax at the beginning, because they used to be regulars at Henry's. 
And yeah. when I lost last Sabbath, I was offered management of Climax, so I, yeah, yeah. I, I declined. Um, didn't seem didn't didn't the right seem. band to follow Sabbath. So <laughs> <man. laughs> um, no, well, I'm so signed with Warner Brothers, actually, to be signed with Big Bear. They didn't have to afford you. <laughs> so, who was in the band? The original when I the When I first joined, it was Colin, the original singer, yeah. and also Derek Holt, a good player. Uh, yeah, who was the original bass player. And look, these guys have written uh, the hits, which the big hit was Couldn't Get It Right, which is yeah. internationally acclaimed. And also num uh, number 10 in America, and also number 7 or 8 here. And also a couple of other big, big hits. Um, so that was the band that I joined, which was also Les Hunt, on guitar, and George Glover on keyboards, who are still in the band to this day, yeah. yeah. You still work with them? I, I do. We, we have a new album out, uh, released last year. And um, we're doing really well. We had some great reviews. It went to number one in the Amazon Blues charts last year. So that's given us a platform to sort of, you know, a lot of resurgence with in, and interest within the band. So we're, we're touring. We're off to Europe in two weeks, Germany, Switzerland. Yeah. So what do you do? 20, 30 shows a year, maybe? Uh, probably more than that, actually. No. I mean, there was, there was that period when Colin died, unfortunately, eight or nine years ago. And we were on that verge of is this band going to continue because it was such a big, a big force, you know? And, but his fact, we had the blessing of his family that, you know, they wanted us to continue. So we have a brand new lineup. We have Graham D on vocals, Chris Aldridge on saxophone, uh, yes, who's an absolute monster player, me, um, Neil Simpson on bass, and the guys I've just mentioned, Les Evans. And uh, yeah. George Glover, and that's the current lineup, and we're still going strong. Yeah. Could you clarify one thing? That there's a, repeatedly a, another breakaway climax in America. This is back to Derek Holt. Oh, uh, the, yes, about it. Uh, I mean, this is this is, <laughs> this is actually a, some touchy subject, so I won't, I won't dwell on it too much. But oh. Derek has decided, after leaving the band of his own accord some thirty years ago, to suddenly come and decide to make a climax blues band, which is basically. Uh, nothing to do with the guys who have been keeping this name alive, slogging around Europe, making albums. So it's a bit of a sore point, but look, yeah, that's more potatoes. Okay. <laughs> so also in, in your, uh, in your, on your CV, there's some other interesting names. Where does Steve Gibbons go? No, you, you take us through it chronologically. So you're with Climax, yes, and work, really. work was not so... Well, it was actually was, was really. So, busy. how do you find time for all this other stuff? Um, I'm always on the road. Well, I've always Which played. Why he never responds to any emails, any phone calls, anything? It's <laughs> not true, Jim. I should get there eventually. I mean, it's it's nice that people ask you, isn't it? Though you know, and I guess if you've been around for a long, long time, you get a certain reputation. People call you. So, I mean, I have played with quite a lot of people from Amisha Paris. Alexander O'Neill, Gilbert O'Sullivan, and one of the big ones was Chuck Berry. Tell me two things. How did that come about? Oh, how was the man? <laughs> okay, Chuck Berry. I did a, a show in the square in Barcelona in front of 70,000 people. Uh, the reason that came about was Clive, the Climax Blues Band were on the same bill. And part of the deal, because he never took a band on the road, he was always a, a pickup band that he used, you know. Part of our deal, we would do our own show, and then three of us, keyboards, bass, and drums, would back Mr. Berry, which we were all really, really excited about. And of course, you know the man's reputation for being slightly difficult. But, <laughs> I mean, we had no rehearsal. We had a 10-minute meeting with the man before we went on in front of these thousands and thousands of people. <laughs> and. Uh, I've got time for a couple of anecdotes. Oh, this is talking about Chuck Berry, as long as you're right. <laughs> okay, so we were ushered in to Mr. Berry's dressing room. Uh, he never looked up or said hello to us. And, uh, and I think Derek was the bass player at the time. He said, um, Mr. Berry, um, do you have a set list for tonight's show? He said, I don't do set lists. <laughs> um, he said, who's the drummer? I sort of frighteningly said, yeah, yeah. He said, when I do that, you stop. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> at this point, Derek, Derek said, well, uh, any idea of the, 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 the opening song, the first song? 
He says, yeah, bitch, your berries. <laughs> so that was our rehearsal. <laughs> but, but once we got up there, what a fantastic, you know, to play with a legend. And there's actually clips on YouTube of, of the performance, so if anybody wants to maybe check them out with me. We were all looking extremely terrified on there, so uh, yeah, but what, what an experience playing with that Did you keep here. in touch with them? But did you keep in touch with him? No. <laughs> if you're going to be as rude as Chuck Berry, you don't be as good as Chuck Berry. Well, basically, he must have had such a hard time in his formative years, his early years, when he was ripped off by promoters, by agents, by whatever, you know. And he's, he had obviously made the decision this is never going to happen to me again. I do know that the money for the show was paid up front <coughs> in cash. And the allocated time for a show was just one 60-minute set. And, uh, and of course, of course, because it's Chuck Berry, he's going to get an encore, isn't he? But he won't go back on until you come up with another $2,000 or whatever the currency is. <laughs> so I saw that first hand. Yes, yeah. yeah. We had that here. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, you know, what a great, great experience. Yeah. So you think he was only slightly more difficult than Steve Gillens, right? No, Steve, Steve's a darling. In fact, is he here somewhere? Yes, but I don't know that darling. Steve's. What are we going to see? I mean, Steve's. He's easily a piece of rubber, obviously. Absolutely, a, uh, a real local hero, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, what do you record with him? I've never recorded, I've only ever done gigs. I was never actually in the Steve Gibbons band, I've just done sort of depth gigs for Steve. But, uh, um, so, now you just come up to tour with another <laughs> local. <laughs> national, international, interstellar legend, Roy Wood. Yeah, with Roy. I've been with Roy for 25 years. You know, I did a long time here with Roy, and a time here with Ruby, and the time we were working in Chicago, you were 132 years old. Yes, that's <laughs> about right, actually, yeah. So. But yeah, Roy, I've been with Roy a long time, um, and I'm a, another absolute local legend, as you know. Um, and we tour most years, in fact, every year. This year was a little bit shorter than um, uh, you know two as we've run in the past because he's not been well. Um, the guy's in his seventies now, but we we do this big show every year at the Symphony Hall. You probably know that. We, we should, I think we've been doing it for seven or eight years now, and the idea is that Roy goes on and does his show. We have an opening act, and then we have various guests who we actually get to play with the band. And it's been fantastic over the years. I think we've had, uh, got to play with Chatham Day, which is my brother-in-law John's his hero, so we didn't care about anything else. In fact, no, I got to play with Chatham Day, May Day. Um, Mary Wilson this year. Um, for me, last year was, was the one, because I actually got to play with Mark King from Level 42, who was an absolute hero. Yeah. So that was terrifying, to go and play at the Symphony Hall with Mark King. Um, Paul Young, uh, Proclaimers, so that's been a, a yearly thing, so yeah, Roy Wood as well, I guess. And, and uh, you still have fine time with all that to run your own band? Well, I've got a few uh, local oh, bands, yeah, I mean, you can probably see me playing around Birmingham a lot with uh, The Quiet Men, which is uh, a lovely little band with Dan Mason and Colin Brown, fantastic little trio. Also, Who was Colin with? Colin used to be uh, Kate Bush's keyboard player, and he also plays with Barker James Harvest. Yeah, um, Dan's just this local fantastic guitarist from Leek. And I also play with my partner, Emma Johnson, who you know, um, and she's got a new album out, I'm going to give her a plug. She's in LA at the moment, so she's not around, so. Uh, Emma's a boogie-woogie pianist who's fantastic. So I like to go and put a C gem, who actually played here um, quite a few times, and they're all old friends, Bob Wilson, uh, Frank Walker, uh, Brian Baddams, who plays with Elkie Brooks. So I do all that as well, I get to play locally. And finally, before we move on to question time, excuse yourself over to me, Christy. <laughs> I didn't think you knew about that, James. So. <laughs> you worked with Tony? I've worked with Tony, yes. So. Tony's great, I mean, another... He's the sweetest guy, isn't he? Yeah, he's lovely, he lives in, just down the road in Litchfield. Um, I've toured with Tony, I've toured um, Germany, and I've also done gigs in it. That's, it's, and if you want to know how, again, it's because you know the people in the band. It was Danny McCormack, the keyboard player with Roy. So that's, that was the connection there. And, but Tony's lovely, and 
you know, I've got to play the sister way to Am Amarillo. So, you know, once or twice. <laughs> Listen, Rue Evans, this is your opportunity. Questions, please. When you're not on the road, what music do you like to listen to? Well, a, again, it's pretty much like I play a wide spectrum of music, and that's my taste in music. I, I, I'm a big jazz fan, actually, a huge jazz fan, um, because jazz is the music of unemployment. As any <laughs> I actually play the trumpet once a month in Bilston. Do you know the trumpet? Um, with a fantastic female saxophonist called Patsy Gamble. Um, so I, I, I'm a huge jazz fan, but also, you know, any music, you know, even, cla even classical, should you say. Even classical. Uh, Mozart, um, yeah. Yeah, I've got my time. I think it's one of some Mozart things. <laughs> so yeah, um, pretty much like, like, you know, I think as a, as a drummer, um, when I was young, I was always scared about arriving at a gig and somebody would ask me to play a style that I couldn't actually play. So I think if, if one of my big sort of uh, pluses as, as a drummer is that I can sort of get through most styles of music. And I think that's what a lot of the younger players do these days. They, they, there's some fantastic young drummers around, or some scary players. And I think they all encompass the, the whole you know, spectrum of music. But I think you have to do that too. So so don't just, very flexible then. I, I, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I can cover most, most I've got a question. Okay. I know you're prevaricating, get away from it. Give me, give me your three favourite drummers, the drummers you really respect. Okay, that's three. Okay, Steve Gadd probably. Mm -hmm. uh, again, because that guy's so versatile, versatile, he's played from Barbra Streisand to Chick Corea to, to pop gigs. Uh, jazz wise, Tony Williams and Buddy Rich. Yeah, Tony Williams probably, and, um, and of course, Buddy Rich. And, and you know Charlie Watts as well. If you're going back to that sort of simple, yeah, uh, yeah play uh, play exactly what's required for the song. Charlie Watts had that, and so did Ringo. Really, I hear a lot of people sort of criticising Ringo. No, because he played exactly what was right for every Beatles song. So rock drummer, who's he raised one of the best rock drummers? Uh, Ian Pace, John Bonham, local lad. Yeah, John Bonham. Yeah, I met John uh, once, but he was extremely. Inebriated, so I didn't have much of a conversation. Come on, let's have some questions from Paul. Well, Chico, you know what a friend. Where's your next set of gigs? Um, well, my next gig is a blues festival with the Climax Blues Band in two weeks, which is in Skegness. How romantic is that? Yeah. <laughs> it is a good festival, yeah. There's some really big names just over the whole weekend. And then I go to Europe um, early February. For two and a half weeks with Climax Blues Band, yeah. There's nothing with Roy now until next Christmas, so he sort of hibernates now until <laughs> November this year. What's the hassle with taking your, your drum kit with you to Europe? Well, I don't have to because what happens with we fly there and then all the gear is hired, so it's all provided. You use the, the, the sheet, you write down what you require, yeah. and then when you get to Europe, it's not always right, but it's, it's a drum kit, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It's still going to sound like me, whatever. So. <laughs> Two more questions. So, Roy, any preferred, uh, I know you're not in the line of business to advertise drum kits and drum producers, but any preferred drum kit? Yeah, well, um, I think I said to Jim earlier, my f very first drum kit was a Gretsch drum kit that my parents bought me, and I bought a 70s Gretsch kids last year, and that's probably my favourite kit. Um, I've got about four or five drum kits, but that, that one particularly uh, I'm very fond of because of the initial sort of connection with being my first drum kit, yeah. Uh, but I've got a, a sort of endorsement deal with Sabian Symbols, who have sort of been good to me the last 35 years or so. so yeah. Cheers. <laughs> well, thank you for your kind attention. It's uh, illuminating. So, first drummer we've ever had, I believe. First and last. Yeah. Aren't they an interesting species? Put your hands together. Thank you very much.